Okay, once again then. Uh, the main principles on how to measure transport properties are these uh, three here. Quantifying the, the binding properties, the first one, and measuring the transport properties we are doing in two different ways, you could say. More or less for everything we are trying to measure. We are using one of these two methods. The first one, to try to establish steady state flow through a slice of your specimen, or through a slice of your material and measure that flux and of course knowing what, what difference you applied on the two surfaces or perhaps measure the steady state profile through your specimen. That could give you a transport property and also the concentration dependency or the moisture dependency of it. Um, when it comes to non-steady state methods, well obviously steady state methods are usually time-consuming. It takes a lot of time to wait for the steady-state conditions to appear. For moisture, we have examples where PhD students have waited for three years just to get these steady-state conditions and obviously that is not a very good method. Instead, we are using a lot of non-steady-state methods where we are measuring perhaps ingress profiles or drying profiles during a non-steady state process or you measure the the weight gain, the weight loss, uh, the ab amount of absorbed species or the amount of leached out species during a non-steady state process or you could measure a penetration depth that is a simple way to measure a penetration depth as a measure of the non-steady state transport process. I will give you some examples. First, fixation properties. Let me show, show this already when it comes to measuring the absorption isotherm for, for moisture. The traditional way is to do it like this. And, okay, I thought I had a, a link here. Um, create some constant climate, wait for equilibrium, and measure the, the amount of moisture. That's the simple way to do it. You can do it in a series. You can have a series of climates where you have different specimens in different climates, of course, and then you will get a large scatter. If you instead take the same sample, put it in different uh, climates after you have reached equilibrium, you will get a smaller scatter, but it takes a long time. Some of our students have used years to create absorption isotherm like that and of course when you start and when you finish you have different materials that's an obvious risk. Controlling carbonation is one important part of this. One of our students had a one meter long CO2 filter but um, it didn't work for a whole year so the results were affected by, by carbonation anyway. Uh, if you want to, I, okay, I have the link first here. You had a question about how long wait, time to wait for equilibrium. And that is a very good question because we, we, have, we have no simple answer to that question. You have to make up your mind. That is the, and, and how to define what you are satisfied with as a measure of your equilibrium. And I have, I have one example here that makes this tricky. See if I can find the cursor here. There it is. Oh, sorry. This is the, an example of measuring the equilibrium moisture content in one climate, 43% RH. Just have to skip this. Okay. Well, you can see here that for a tiny specimen, a thin slice, going on for one year, didn't show any obvious equilibrium. If you have a good balance, you will notice that. <coughs> 
And that, that, this, that means that something, is, something else is happening during your attempt to reach equilibrium in moisture content with your surroundings. And uh, if we only had this result here, we wouldn't understand this. But the student here, she also measured the absorption, the equilibrium at absorption. So taking a similar specimen, dry it first, and then put it in 43% RH, gave her a weight increase, a weight gain, because of absorption of moisture to this level. And then a continuous loss of weight. Because something is happening in the structure of the material. So then it's tough to discuss what is equilibrium when there's a chance that the, the material is changing and in this structural change there is a loss of water. This could be, I think this was a sample with 10% silica fume. So it could be a polymerization of the CSH losing some water with time. So that is what you could end up with if you are, have a good balance and you're waiting a long time. If you want to measure the sorption isotherm at very young age, at very early age, as a function of um, degree of hydration, uh, Mette showed the results this morning were well, measurements of the different sorption isotherms at different ages or different degrees of hydration um, was measured. The technique to measure that, instead of waiting for equilibrium, this student took a sample from a specimen that had been dried a little and, well, not considering about to what extent and so on, dried a little and then taking a small sample and measure three things on that sample fairly quick, within a day. Measure the RH first. If you measure the RH here, you have one, one measure. Then on the same sample you measure the moisture content. So you measure this one. You get this point because of that. And then you quantify the degree of hydration on, your, on the same sample. And you can measure these th three things in that order. That's fully possible within a day or so, maybe, maybe two days. So you can actually quantify a point at a sorption isotherm that is changing with time. You can do it within a very short time. You saw the scatter. The scatter was fairly big, but um, it could be done better. But each point in the, in the sorption isotherm you showed was one sample, one individual sample where you made three measurements. So it could be done. The same holds, of course, for measuring a binding isotherm. I just used the same curve here, but I just changed this to concentration in a solution, and this is the total con content or the bound content that would give you a binding isotherm. And you have a similar problem with this. If you're measuring it in the usual way, you have a series of solutions with different concentrations. You put samples in there, you wait for equilibrium, and then you measure the total content or the bound content. And that is not an easy measurement. Especially important and difficult is to maintain the solution you had from the beginning. And usually what is not uh, controlled is the, the composition of the solution. Because if you start with a sodium chloride solution, you will end up with a sodium chloride alkali hydroxide solution that will give you a different binding. So you get leaching during that process. When you're waiting for equilibrium, you get leaching changing the properties. So a better way would be to decide what alkali concentration would you 
like to have and start with that. So we actually measure with that parameter also under control. And how do you measure the total content being bound during an exper experiment? Well, if you make one measurement and then take another sample, make another measurement of the total content, it could be very difficult to get any significance in that, the small differences. One way to do it was to, or is to, instead of measuring the content available in your sample, is to measure how much did it absorb from your solution. So you can design your experiment to instead of measuring this number here, you can measure how much did this drop. Because if that dropped, that means that the drop is what get, went into your specimen. So that's a good way to measure the amount of bound species. Measure the dropping concentration. I can show you an, inter an interesting results of that kind of measurement. Looking like this. This is a chloride binding isotherm with bound chloride here and the concentration of chloride in the solution here. And each point here is one measurement where you measured the dropping concentration in the solution. And of course you have to design your setup so that drop is not too large because then you have an interval but large enough to be able to measure it, measure the change um, accurately. That technique could be used also for moisture and other species, of course, and to my knowledge it's not, never been used for, for moisture, for instance. But we can measure moisture very accurate, so it could be done also for, for moisture absorption measurements. When you are making measurements like this, you have a problem if you have small samples and you have concrete or mortar, obviously. Because you, you think you have a, a mix composition of paste and particles in your, in your mix. This is what you have. But when you take a small sample, you could have another proportion of between the paste and the particles. And what you are trying to measure is, is usually in the paste and not in the particles. But what you can measure here is the weight or perhaps the mass of the total sample. And that means that you get a tremendous scatter if you're just measuring the content of your sample. You need to be able to quantify the proportions between paste and particles in your sample. Measure something else that has the same proportion as the species you have uh, try to measure. For instance, the binder content. If you measure the binder content of your sample or the cement content, you can refer your amount of species you measured to the binder content instead of just to the, the weight or the mass of your sample. That is a way to, uh, to do it. So that's why we, we measure not like this, okay, but measure the, the mass per mass of binder or mass of cement. For moisture, we have a technique to, to avoid this because we have the same problems with moisture. If you take a small sample from concrete or mortar and try to measure the moisture content, the moisture content depends on how much sand do you have in your sample, how much paste you have. And that is not what you are trying to measure. You want to measure how much, much is really relevant so what you could do, oh, I thought I had that here. Okay, I will come to that. Where did it, where did it go? It's here. Yeah. This is how it's done. Take a small sample. You, it might not be representative. The mixed proportions are, uh, are not the same in the sample, a small sample, as in your concrete or ritual material. So the moisture content would be wrong, since that is the amount of water per mass of the sample. Take the same sample, put it in water, 
put it in contact with water, saturate it. Saturate it not by vacuum, because then you're saturating the airway system. Saturate the gel pores and the capillary pores. Then you will get the measure of the pore volume in your sample. That will be equally wrong as the first one. But they are equally wrong. So just simply divide them with each other. And you get rid, rid of the error. Very simple way to do it. This is one example. The crosses here are measurements of the moisture content on small samples. And this is the sample size. And you can see here, with smaller sample size, the error goes up. So you can end up with very large errors if you have small samples of materials like that. But if you instead take the same samples, saturate them by put them in contact with water and measure the amount of water when it's saturated, you get the, the rings here. And you can see here that there is no dependency of the size of your sample. You can get an equally uh, correct moisture measurement on small samples. One reason for problems with your samples could be this, what I call the binder profile. So if you have a, 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 a sample this size or a specimen this size, perhaps you cast it this way as a slab something will happen in your concrete slab during casting. Of course, the bottom is, close, uh, is on, uh, in contact with the formwork, and the top is uh, level off in some way. So that means that the larger particles cannot be equally um, present everywhere at all depths. That means that you have a higher binder content close to the bottom surface and close to the top surface. This is the top surface, and this is the bottom surface. And you can see here what the binder profile looks like. The binder content goes up close to the top surface, and the binder content goes up close to the bottom surface, and the whole bottom surface is tilted to some extent because of separation during casting and uh, compaction. If you then study transport processes here, quantify ingress profiles and so on, you need to be able to, to quantify this binder profile. For instance, if you measure a chloride profile and you express every point here, you take a sample at different depths, you measure the chloride content and you express it in terms of mass, uh, mass of your sample, you can get a nice curve like this. But if you also measure the binder content of each sample, which would be a better measure of the actual content, since the chlorides are in, this, in the paste and not in the aggregate, you would get this profile with a peak like this. The same sample. And why is that? Well, that's because of the binder content. The binder content next to a cast surface where you have a formwork usually looks like this, where you have a very high binder content close to the surface. You have a minimum, and you could have a maximum again. That is what the binder content looks like. And this is because of this wall effect next to a formwork. If you have a formwork, and you have aggregate particles in your mortar or in your concrete. Particles this size cannot be present here. So there is obviously a lack of larger particles next to the, the formwork, meaning you have a higher binder content. And you can even explain this maximum here if you know the size of your aggregate. So you would end up with a binder profile like that.
cut it off. Cut the surface off of pessimism. That would be the easiest way. But it's not easy to do at an early age if you want to do it early and so on. When you want to measure a transport process, you have a similar problem with, with the aggregates. If this is your mix with paste and aggregate and you want to take a thin slice, of course you cannot take it too thin. Because if you take it too thin, you don't know really what happens in between the particles. Maybe the transport could go through the particle or in the interfacial transition zone between the particles and the paste. And it's a question, of course, is it enough to have this thickness comparing to the size of your grains? We usually want to have at least this size, maybe a th th slice, slice having a thickness three times the size of your aggregate. But that means that you have a, a much longer experiment. It would take nine times as long to make your measurement, perhaps. So that is a, a compromise you have to, to think about. And if you want to have thinner slices, maybe you should try different thicknesses and, and show that they are giving the same results. Measuring the transport properties with the steady state method means that you are doing one of these uh, three things here, you could say, or maybe two things because these two are the same. You have a slice of your material, you apply different conditions on the two sides. Could be gas pressure, could be air pressure, could be iron concentration, could be moisture, humidity differences, and so on. Apply that, wait for uh, steady state to occur, meaning that you have to measure, you have to measure the flux. You have to measure the flux in some way. And you can have to see that the flux is not changing anymore. I get the same flux all the time. Then you have reached steady state conditions. This is the type we are using for moisture. And the flux is simply measured by measuring the weight of your setup. The weight loss means the flux getting out. That is a measure of the flux. For other things, you measure the flux, for instance, for gas or for air, you're measuring the volume of the, the penetrating substance. And if you have a setup like this with different ion concentrations, you usually measure the change in ion concentration on one side. The change in ion concentration means that you can quantify the flux. And if you do not want the ion concentration to change too much, you exchange the solution here. So you maintain it in, at the level you want it. And in this way, you can quantify the flux maintaining the, the difference in concentration. This is also a way to do it. Uh, this has been used mostly for, for moisture, but you have a thicker slice, thicker specimen. You apply a difference in humidity on the two sides, and you're waiting for equilibrium. And that could, of course, take time if it's a thick, thick uh, specimen. Measure the flux, and then measure also the profile. <laughs> through. And from the profile, you can quantify the, the slope being the derivative of your, your state parameter. And from that, those two, you can quantify a transport property. Could be used also for other transport processes than moisture. Non-steady state methods. In principle, they could be very different. But actually, what you're doing in non-steady state uh, methods are more or less the same if you're measuring moisture or ion transport or gas transport or whatever. Uh, 
you're measuring one of these three things. You could put your whole specimen on a balance, or you could measure the total amount being absorbed into it. That would be give you a weight gain or loss, or the absorption of something as an average. That means that you know what's going in or out like that. But you don't know the distribution. You simply only know what is getting out or in, but not the distribution. So it's an uncertainty. You have to guess what the distribution will be. You, you can have a model for it, and you can make a comparison. But you don't know if the model is correct if you don't measure the profile. And if you're, you have a good correlation between the weight gain, weight loss, or the amount of absorbed species, and your model, that doesn't necessarily mean that the model is correct. You could get similar results anyway, even if you have other assumptions. So this is um, a little bit tricky, but it's frequently used for, for instance, for moisture measurements. I've done it myself and uh, a lot, and um, I'm not very convinced that it works very well. Uh, but it's the uh, very easy way to do it. Make a specimen, start to put it in the balance under control con uh, surrounding conditions, and measure the weight loss. Very simple. But what comes out of it could be could be questioned. So you have to be careful about how you how you analyze that kind of data. One tricky part is to to know what is actually to expect it after a long time. Where is the equilibrium after a long time? And you usually do not have time to wait for that. So you have to have an estimate of the equilibrium conditions after a long time. And all the results will depend on your estimate of that, those conditions. One way to deal with that is to measure the equilibrium conditions on a, or on a parallel specimen, smaller in size, so you get a quicker result for that one. That could be a way, but then you have to make sure that your two s sizes of specimens are equally equal when it comes to reaching this um, equilibrium condition. One easy way too would be to, of course, measure the penetration depth. If you could do that, that would give you one point on a penetration profile, of course. And of course, better would be to measure the full ingress profile. But that is more complicated. And for some species, it's very difficult, uh, as, uh, as, uh, uh, at least when, if you need a very good resolution. We are very good at measuring profiles when it comes to ions. Because we can, we can take thin slices, and we can make analysis of the content of each slice very well. We can refer that content to the binder content, for instance, so we can get a very good resolution. But we have very difficult, uh, it's very difficult to do it for, for moisture, for instance. Because you cannot handle a thin slice of moisture, because it will dry. So you never know where you end up with. And depends, on course, of course, on the type of aggregate and the size of the aggregate you have. But it's not easy to measure destructively moisture profiles. You need to have another type of technique, non-destructively. And we have, luckily enough, we have some of the techniques that could be used, uh, especially if you do not have a lot of larger uh, aggregates. You have a technique for, with the NMR, I believe, we have a computer tomography using X-ray. We have several gamma uh, ray techniques and so on that could be used. So that would be, but then you probably need some calibration in some of these cases that is difficult. Let's look into this steady state methods that we are using for these species here. We have used it for moisture, we have used it for um, ions, we have used it for, of course, ion migration. We, use it for, we can use it for gas diffusion, 
We use it for uh, gas permeation. We could use it for carbon dioxide. And so on. So there's no limit to this. And this, it's a very simple technique in, in, in theory. But it could be difficult to actually to, to, uh, to use. And the principle is, of course, to try to measure, quantify this flux. For moisture, this is the way we do it. We, you, you use your specimen as a, a lid to a cap. The cap here could be uh, something made of glass, so you have no permeation at all. And then you put the, your, your specimen as a lid here, seal it off at the edges, so you have one directional flow and then maintain a certain humidity inside using a salt solution or something else, but uh, the common way to do it is using a salt solution. If we have uh, more humid conditions inside than here, you can call it a wet cap. If you have a drying agent inside, you call it a dry cap. And if you want to avoid the problems with this air gap here, having a certain resistance to moisture flow, you could put it upside down, like this. So you have direct contact with water and the upper surface here. So you get controlled conditions at uh, the inner side as well, like this. And, and this is a traditional, this is even a standard for, for making measurements like this. Not for this one, but for the other two. This is what it could li look like. Typical glass cap with a slice of your specimen and some sealant at the edges, like this. Put it in a uh, at the balance every now and then to check that you have steady state conditions, this, uh, same weight loss with time, and um, then quantify the weight loss as a, as a flux. Uh, this is what uh, the upside down cap could look like. If you have water inside here, you have a closed volume of air. And you could, of course, well, be afraid that the air pressure would decrease with time when the water get, get, uh, moves out. But that is not a problem for concrete. It's so dense, so that it's a, an insignificant effect. We have had specimens like this for six, seven, eight, nine years, and we, we get a steady state all the time, the same all the time. When it comes to non-steady state measurements, for instance, for ions uh, and diffusion, you have this um, simple model to describe an ingress profile when it comes to ion transport. This is usually called the, the error function solution to the fixed second law. And I don't know if you are familiar with the, the mathematical function ERFC. Have you seen that before? Sorry? Only without the C, OK. The C is the complement, yeah. You see, yes, if with only the ERF, you should have one minus, yeah. And here you have two parameters, one being the diffusivity. So if you can fit a measurement, a measure profile to this equation, you can quantify, if, and you, you know the time, the exposure time, you can quantify your diffusivity. And this is a very simple measurement in theory, and it's frequently done. Engineers are doing this on site, on structures, on exposed specimens and in the lab. And uh, when you start looking into ion transport, this is what you're doing, because it's so simple. But unfortunately, um, a PhD project is only limited in time to three or four years, so most never come further than that. And then we didn't learn very much, unfortunately, because this is, a, this is not a very good model. We have learned that today. <laughs> 
This model has been used for 25 years. It was invented, so to speak, for chloride in 1970, published in Italian 1970, in English 1972, used by engineers for 25 years, designing structures, and some eventually realizing that it's not correct. Because this is not a material property, this one here. Diffusivity changes with age or changes with time. Not because concrete is densified with time, but because of other reasons. But it fits data. That's why it's so popular. If you make an ingress experiment and after some time measure the, the concentration at different depths, you get the points here. And these points usually coincides very well with this equation, the red curve here. That is this error function complement curve. So just sit, fit your measured profile with this equation and then you have your diffusivity here. This is the way it's done. And um, you can, as I said, doubt if this is really very interesting because there's a lot of things happening during such an experiment, especially with the other ions. And you have to be careful here about your binder profile, for instance, here. It fits, it fits very well if you express it in terms of mass of your sample. But that, that is because the binder content is higher here. So that's why the curve looks like this. If you correct for that, it doesn't fit very well. So you have to skip some points at the beginning. And that is what people do. And the problem is that different people skip different numbers of points. And that doesn't say so. How do you, how do you do, deal with that? How do you value information in a scientific paper if you do not know how the analysis was done? You have to, we have to find a way around this. You saw yesterday this, um, the migration cell test method. Did you, did you use it or did, was it just uh, demonstrated? Sorry? You, you just saw it. It wasn't, was it now? Did you also see a split of a, a specimen and so on? It was just a. Okay, that's a slide. Okay, so you didn't see it. Okay, okay, okay. But it's, it's using this, this equation for the flux of, of ions. And trying to avoid this too much, this diffusion process, by increasing the electrical potential, you could almost, you could almost skip this term. And if you have a saturated specimen, you can skip this one. No convection, no moisture movement. So you have almost only this one. But if you would ha have only that one, the solution to this equation would be a, a step like this, a step, a front, a, a, a very sharp penetration front. But that is not what we see. So it's not in my handouts. I, I realized when I came today that that you saw this yesterday, so I, I wanted to give you the background. Um, so in practice you have some effect of this diffusion around the front, so the front will not be too sharp. The principle is this, instead of waiting for steady state where you have applied an electrical potential difference, having zero concentration here and a certain concentration here. That would take you a month or so for that experiment. Instead of doing that, you do it non-steady state, which means that you can do it in a short time. And instead of measuring the flux through, you're measuring the effect of the flux into your specimen. You could do it by measuring the penetration depth. I had one student doing that, his name is Tang. He developed this, this technique. He measured the depth. 
and realized how to develop or evaluate a diffusion coefficient from this depth. The depth measurement is very simple. You're just simply spraying silver nitrate on a, on a cracked surface. And from that, he could evaluate the diffusion coefficient. And this is what is used now in experiments in, in uh, research laboratories and in, in various laboratories around the world. But sometimes you are lucky enough to have very clever students. So he was one of them. And here's another one. He realized after tens of years with this equation here, that this equation means that I have steady state conditions already from the beginning. This flux is constant at the upstream surface. Because at the upstream surface, you have the same concentration with time because you're driving chlorides in. So this is a constant. And if this is a constant, why not measure the dropping concentration here? Instead of measuring the increasing concentration here after some time, you can measure the dropping concentration here and get the measure of the flux into the specimen. And a new method was, was found. This is from uh, Insight in Toulouse. And, uh, but it re required, of course, a very, very precise measurement of concentrations, or two concentrations, the original concentration and the concentration after some hours a micro pipette and a very good analysis made it possible. And you can do it within a few hours. You saw this, um, see if I can get the, yeah. you saw this method, it's called the anti-build 492, what you saw yesterday. And this is the, 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 um, set up a container with a salt solution, a specimen, and a solution here without chlorides, two electrodes to drive chlorides in. And it's designed so you can, you can do it for 24 hours. And then you split the specimen. This is what it looks like. Here you can see the specimens. And after that, you split the specimen, you spray silver nitrate on the specimen, and uh, silver nitrate reacts with chlorides, forming silver chloride. And that is the white stuff here. And you can see the front. And that is evaluated, as described yesterday, by measuring the depth and taking an average of that. And I, uh, Karen uh, commented that while I, the front looked very strange, but that is because you measure on concrete. So if you have a stone here and there, you will have a block, of course, of the penetration because of this electrical potential difference. But this is, if not done in this way, it's very difficult to make measurements like this because if you have a small leakage, around the edges, for instance, that would totally dominate the flux through your specimen. But here, a leakage wouldn't matter because the, a leakage would simply give you a, a larger, con, larger depth of penetration here at the edges, and you would see that. So you can, you can avoid including that into your analysis. The theory says, it should look like this, where the penetration, according to the equation, is almost the front, but because of diffusion, you have some um, um, slope of this penetration front. But the interesting part is here, you can actually quantify 
something similar to a diffusion coefficient or diffusivity from this type of measurement. And this is now used in service life models. A lot in, in this country, in Germany, for instance, they are using this a lot. In Denmark, uh, there's a company using this all over the world when designing concrete structures. And it's put into a, um, a diffusion coefficient in a service life model. And you can quantify the effect of different compositions of, of cementitious materials and, of course, find a tremendous effect of water binder ratio, but also of the binder. And you can see a tremendous effect of this ordinary Portland cement, 5% silica fume, some fly ash, or if you combine fly ash and silica fume, you can see a tremendous difference in the densification of the, of the pore structure where these black boxes down here are the measurements of compositions containing fly ash and silica fume combined with Portland cements, and those are really dense. Um, this, the results of that test method is also used to compare to field exposure data. And these are field, field exposure data from, okay, from 10 years. 10 years of exposure on this axis. And this is the test result from this migration test method. And you can see here that the numbers, the absolute numbers, are not this, identical. This point should be here, but there is a difference here. And that difference depends on the binder, the type of binder. So for some binders, there is another behavior than in this, in this test. But still, this is used for quantification of the effect of various parameters, and it's being used actually for practical applications. And you can doubt this, is that, if that is really um, correct to do at the present state of knowledge. Okay, my final picture here. Of course, there's a lot of things to say about characterization, transport processes. I tried to summarize here points to, to, uh, to remember. Of course, quantifying transport processes and try to measure transport properties needs an understanding. You need, you need to understand what you're doing. You need to understand the mechanisms involved in, if you're setting up an experiment. You need to know what kind of specimen you're measuring on, and especially the things that will be relevant for your, for your measurement. And um, of course, it's one thing to prepare your specimen, but also to cure it in a proper way. And it's not easy to cure a, a concrete specimen without any uh, doubt on if this is correct or not. Remembering, for instance, the self-desiccation. And that means that if you're doing anything else than sealing your specimens, you will get profiles of a lot of things in your specimens from your surfaces and inwards. So, um, and maybe you do not want to start with those conditions you get after self-desiccation. So what do you do then? How do, you, how do you prepare your specimens? How do you condition your specimens? And I have to point out again the problem with carbonation. You, you need to avoid that. Then when you have made a setup where you get some transport processes and you're making your measurements, if you're taking samples, you have to be very careful if you're analyzing destructively or non-destructively, you, you have to have a very careful calibration process in most cases. And of course, if you're evaluating a transport property, you have to think about what models to use, of course, and the relevance of those models. Yes, I think that is my final picture, yes. <laughs>
Okay.